Oh. Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Manager of Dataversity. We'd like to thank you for joining this Dataversity webinar, Data Monetization, Demonstrating Quantifiable Financial Benefits from Enterprise Data Management, sponsored today by Information Asset and your Data Connect. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen, or if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag Dataversity. And if you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. Just click the chat icon in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen for that feature. And as always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides and the recording of the session and additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now let me introduce our speakers for today, uh, Greg, Alex, and Sunil. Uh, Sunil is the CEO and founder of Your Data Connect. He has uh, spent more than a decade in data governance work, including Saints at IBM, Stints at IBM, and Information Asset. Sunil has worked with hundreds of clients across six continents and multiple industries, including banking, insurance, life sciences, retail, telecommunications, manufacturing, oil, gas, healthcare, and government. Greg is the Chief Revenue Officer at Your Data Connect. He uh, is responsible for sales and marketing. He has held sales leadership roles in uh, Information Asset, Calibra, Immuta, in, uh, Initiate Systems, and Business Objects. And Alex is the Chief Technical Officer at Your Data Connect. He is responsible in, his responsibilities in this role include promoting the best practices within the organization, developing the technical skills of others, identifying new opportunities, and driving innovation through technology. And with that, I will turn it over to Sunil to get us started. Hello and welcome. Greg? Yeah, I think Sunil's having uh, audio issues, but I'll go ahead and kick things off, Shannon, if that's okay with you. So thank you. This is Greg. Can you everyone can you hear me okay, Shannon? Am I good? So thanks everyone for joining today. Once again, my name is Greg Urseta, and today we're going to run through uh, a short presentation that'll preface the use cases and the usability of your data connect. And we'll then Alex Scroggins, who's our CTO, will run through a short presentation. So we encourage all questions, please ask during, uh, or put into the queue. So your data connect, as Shannon said, is the industry's first cloud-based monetization platform. Now think of your data connect as an extension to everything you've already done inside your data organization. From the evolution, you know, starting with business intelligence, data warehousing, master data management, the, uh, the advent of data governance, and then what we found and discovered, and as Shannon said earlier, with all the, pre, uh, all the implementations that we've done throughout our careers, one thing was always missing and was difficult to obtain, and that was end user business adoption or giving business the ownership of the data, allowing them to take ownership. So when we created your data connect, don't think of it as reinventing the wheel. This is an extension to everything you've already done within your data ecosystem. So we're going to show you how you can value the data, so to create different lines of, of business in around creating cost savings, mitigating risk, but actually quantifying that data. So you have a continuous ROI. You'll see where you can continually show the business value in the data, taking cost out of the business. We're going to show you how to create new revenue streams, things of that nature. And then when you see data marketplace, I know it's a nomenclature that a lot of people use today in different industries, but it's more of a unified data marketplace, and we'll show you how to use that, those external sharing, internal and external sharing data agreements, and how to help utilize those throughout the organization. And then the, you know, the age-old question, how do, is this data regulatory compliant? So all that that you've done, whether it be with OneTrust or Amuda, even utilizing technology platforms like Big ID and showing that regulatory compliant data. We have hooks into all these applications and are able to extrapolate and show the value of the data as well. So what we saw that when we created your data connect is enterprises just don't have the tools, right, to measure the financial benefits. So you hear a lot, that's the new buzzword is data monetization, but your data connect, as you will see, actually puts it into practice in a tool set, in a platform, much like and utilizing, you know, whether that be Informatica, whether that be Alation, or utilizing what you've done with Calibra as well. 
So we took these, you know, as we have a business value assessment team, and we took a lot of this information, you know, of the, and put it into an actual solution. And what we do with our customers is we, we do what's called a business value assessment, or, you know, as we like to say, a business monetization assessment. And we can take actual initiatives, put those in the, into the solution, and show you how to quantify the data that you've already utilized in those in any data platform that you were using. Now, I'm just giving you examples, but it'd be any type of platform. So what we see in the amount of data, the CDO's role, and the CDO having a go-to platform. So what we're trying to do is give the CDO the ability to show quantifiable, measurable value with that data. And what you'll see here, and we, these are all you know public information. You know, the average tenure of a chief data officer is 2.4 years. Why is that, right? So we have some ideas around that and some of the challenges that the CDO has and he or she's role. So understanding and monetizing that data, you know, we, we're giving you a platform to do that. So you can actually utilize the data as an asset. Measuring that success of the data so you can actually quantify it, whether that be in a, a marketing initiative, whether that be a cost savings initiative, and it really, uh, so as the CDO is charged with revenue creation and cost savings, coupled with mi risk mitigation, you'll see how your data connect can encouple all of that. So that it's not just we're creating this data dictionary, we're creating this business glossary, and we're cataloging all this data for analytics. I understand that, and then all, and our our customers understand that, but actually quantifying and measuring the financial benefits. That's what your Data Connect will do for you. So when you see just as ServiceNow, you know, with the Chief Revenue Officer, and then Salesforce with the Chief Risk Officer has metric stream, data monetization and your Data Connect will be the go-to platform for the CDO and he or she's organization. So what we'll show you is across functional discipline, you know, across all the technologies, all the compliance applications. And what Alex will show you is how we've integrated within all these different applications to utilize not only what you've done with your data management strategy, but data privacy as well. So what you see here, uh, this is an example with one of our customers, and we launched the platform in June, and we have several new customers. And when I say several new customers, some of, some of these, uh, at our, most of them are Fortune 500. And this is an example we use from an industrial manufacturer. And Alice will show you an example similar to this in the presentation. So this is the value. So driven 400 million, right, and a $50 million supply chain, you know, based on all the numbers and finance. So taking all these and quantifying all of this information into an actual solution that can be presented with actual cost savings associated with the solution. And that, when I say that solution, being your data connect. So, once again, there's a cross-functional discipline that we take every, and as I said earlier, first of all, we talk about everything you, you know, within the data management ecosystem, incorporating the different technologies, you know, incorporating all the regulatory compliance, GDPR, CCPA, you've already done all of that work to show that that data is actually compliant, but then, and then integrating and showing the financial benefits across that. So taking that cross-functional discipline, as you see, your Data Connect will allow you, and you'll see this directly in the tool today, grow your revenues, reduce those costs, which is key today, and of course, managing the risk. So when the business is actually utilizing the data for monetizational purposes, they're gonna understand that there's no risk and them using the data, it's regulatory compliant, you know, they'll be able to reduce the cost, and again, reducing costs will help their revenue. And this will all be shown in today's presentation. And once again, if you have any questions, we'll be feel free to put them in the chat window, and we'll go ahead and get those answered as soon as we can. So much like the flow, your data connect, we're going to start with, you know, you know, the, what is the value of your data, right? It internally generate our third party. That's important. And, they, and what we've been able to do with our security model is we'll be able to take those data sharing agreements and share those internally and externally. An example would be from the clinical trials process. You imagine all the data that needs to be shared internally and externally, you'll be able to do that with our solution. So when it comes time, 
to then go and get that clinical trial approved, you know, from the FDA, you didn't miss any steps and you understand the cost and the process along the whole way. And then that goes with that continuous ROI with curating those data assets. And we all want to grow revenue. We all want to reduce costs and manage risk. And once again, that step two within that continuous ROI, which Alex will show in the presentation, is all prevalent in the tool solution. And then once you place those data assets in our data marketplace, now let's say you have a data marketplace. That's fine. We'll incorporate those data assets into our marketplace, once again, for those internal and external sharing agreements. But that's very key. And we've seen that with a lot of our customers not being able to share all the data. Well, then how can you actually value it if you don't utilize all of it? And then once again, we support all the regulatory compliance based on all those workloads, everything you've already done in your existing data infrastructure solution, whether that be, again, it could be Rochade, Calibra, we've worked with all of them, Informatica, Alation, and so on. And then creating throughout that whole process, you know, whether that data be, you know, machine learning data, whether that be artificial intelligence, having that automation is all in prevalent and inherent in the solution as well. And what we've done on top of it in taking all our experience with doing over 100 implementations at our sister company, Information Asset, and also we've created the industry module. So we have financial services built, healthcare, life sciences, utilities, and manufacturing. Now, we built all of these and they're in the solution, but if you don't see your industry in here, we've also worked with others, but our ability to build these industry modules is no, at no cost to you. We would do that as, a, as you become a customer of your Data Connect. All right, so uh, that is just an overall synopsis of your Data Connect. I'm gonna turn it over to Alex and he's gonna actually run through the presentation of the solution and extrapolate on everything I just showed you. Hi everyone, this is Alex. Let me share my screen, we'll get started. Okay. Hi, everyone. So, so first of all, I want to go through um, data portfolio management with, with a demo uh, and then dive into, you know, get deeper uh, into what we mean by data monetization and also speak about data marketplace. Uh, and we'll, we have demos for each of these. Alex, can you put that into uh, presentation mode? It would be easier for everyone to see. So data portfolio management, we refer to this as the process of managing your company's investments in data. Uh, so that includes your databases, data lakes, business intelligence solutions, and ETL processes. So the way that we do that in your Data Connect, the application, sorry, let me uh, switch into the tool now. We'll do a live demo. So your Data Connect crawls your infrastructure to identify, uh, you know, BI reports, databases, uh, ETL jobs, as well as, you know, files and data lakes. And we're trying to identify uh, opportunities for cost savings, such as identify, identifying duplicate reports, tables, and so on. Also, those assets which, which haven't been used recently. So, you know, tables that maybe are legacy, haven't been used in a while, candidates for retirement, just so that we can reduce the amount of technical or data debt that we have in various solutions we've accumulated over the years. So uh, this is the homepage of your Data Connect. What you see, uh, first of all, is this, what we call it the data portfolio summary. This is just a high level view of all of, of your average use, usage of the different technologies you have. So that usage is by looking at the operational metadata to figure out, uh, you know, as I said, what reports are unused, you know, they haven't been accessed or run in a while. For databases, it's, you know, the tables that haven't been queried in a while, the tables and views that haven't been queried. ETL, we're looking at the execution data around your ETL jobs, you know, what jobs look like they're no longer necessary, no longer used. Uh, and, and files as well, what is the last accessed information of various files in your data lake? So that's what this dashboard provides uh, at a high, high level and it's grouped by technology. So for example, this 80% of Domo means, you know, of all the assets we have in Domo, it looks like only 80% of those are actually used you know, on a, a frequent basis, the rest, the 20% might be, you know, technical debt that we could retire just to reduce our footprint in some of these technologies. Uh, going on to the data portfolio, portfolio tab of our application, we see, um, you know, lists of, of different assets. So applications, uh, BI tools, we can see various ones we've uh, crawled here, Domo, Business Objects, Tableau, there, there are others we support. This is just an example, 
Um, we can connect to other catalogs as well. So, you know, other data catalog solutions, metadata management solutions. So our solution can connect directly to many of these sources we're talking about, these BI sources and so on. But uh, if you already have a repository of that information, we can get it from there. So, so as I said, a data catalog or a metadata management tool. Uh, databases as well, and uh, that includes, you know, traditional relational databases as well as NoSQL databases like, um, you know, cloud-based databases in, in AWS or other clouds like uh, DynamoDB, MongoDB, and so on. We are looking at those to count, you know, the number of tables. We have criteria around identifying unused tables, and that's how we arrive at the overall usage. So ETL as well, uh, you know, we support various ETL solutions. We're looking at things like the, uh, as I said, the execution metadata of these various jobs uh, to figure out what ETL jobs are no longer used. File systems as well, and this includes a category of data lakes. So we, you know, connect to various data lakes and get metadata around the files and data lakes to, uh, you know, try to identify te uh, technical debt. So we're dr drilling in now to one of the solutions. This is a DOMO, it's a business intelligence tool. We can see um, we have this parameter, it's the definition of unused. So, you know, what is unused for one solution might be different for another. So this is a number in days that we consider something unused. So it's configurable and we can change the number. But um, this is, you know, how we control that criteria. You know, maybe uh, it's different from organization to organization, that definition of unused. So uh, we can change that parameter there, and we see at a high level, a total number of reports counted, 100, and then a number of unused reports. Within uh, these BI tools, they typically organize your assets by folders. I've opened up one of the folders here, and I can see various reports, as well as the last used date, and a checkbox that will tell me whether individual reports meet that definition of unused we saw at the technology level. So we can see there are you know, roughly 20 or so that meet that definition of unused. And now that we have this information, another benefit of having that is we can calculate things such as the migration costs of moving from one uh, solution to another. So let's say we have various technologies in our, uh, you know, in our enterprise. We we've used our data connect to figure out which ones are uh, candidates for retirement. You know, uh, and and we can create that migration plan to, you know, maybe not only retire some tool, but um, migrate any artifacts that are still used in it to a new solution. So I'll do an example of that now. I'm going to create what we call a technical use case. Uh, we're going to select Migrate BI tool. When we're defining this, we, we give it a name, such as we want to, in this case, migrate from an older BI tool to a newer one. So let's say Migrate Domo to Tableau. We select our source and target of the migration, and then we, for the source, in this case, Domo, we enter the annual software clock, uh, cost. So I'll say $2 million uh, for annual hardware cost, I'll say $5,000, number of developers, 10, the uh, salary of those developers, average salary, I'll say 50000 the number of assets. So I'll leave these blank because these will be pulled in via automation. Uh, we will actually connect to Domo to determine these things, the number of assets, the number of unused assets. So the target, which in this case I've chosen as Tableau, the annual software cost, hours to migrate each report, 40, and then hourly rate, 60. I'll submit this, and we've taken a look at that operational metadata. We've counted that there are um, 100 total assets, but 20 of those are basically unused. They have a meet our definition of unused, which we configured for Domo. Therefore, you know, in, as part of this migration, we recommend you only migrate the 80 reports, which look like they're still actively used. So that's how we arrive at these, uh, these costs around the migration. These are the costs just to migrate the actual active reports in the tool. We estimate an overall cost of that migration to, to migrate the 80 reports of $192,000. And then uh, a break-even point. After 9.2 months, uh, we believe we would break even the costs. And we also provide that ability to track the migration of individual reports. So this is basically a, a log of, you know, what we would do as part of the migration. You know, we could, for each report, 
I have a task, I, I or a developer can come in and leave comments, change status, and uh, once all of the reports have been migrated, um, we can consider the business case closed. Uh, so that is our data portfolio management. They're, we're really just looking at all these technologies, crawling them to find that operational metadata and find opportunities to save costs. So next I want to dive into a more business-oriented uh, use case for data monetization. Uh, so what we're going to do here is define a business case. Uh, so it's a certain scenario for a, a manufacturing environment around uh, if making the lead time of purchase orders, reducing that lead time. So as an example, let me make this full screen. This is an example business case for, for a manufacturer. Due to poor data quality lead times are being extended on purchase orders due to data quality issues around raw materials data. So that's causing revenue losses for each purchase order. The business wants to improve the data quality of raw materials data and therefore improve the lead times for purchase orders and reduce those revenue losses. The business also wants to quantify the value that data quality plays in this uh, process. And the way that will be quantified is it will be a percentage of the overall cost savings for those purchase orders. So uh, let me <coughs> exit this. The way, we, the way we implement this in Your Data Connect, Your Data Connect contains the CDEs, the database columns, and the business rules that are relevant to this scenario. Those business rules get implemented in a third-party data quality tool, and the results uh, of those rules being executed are brought back into Your Data Connect. And, and then we use Your Data Connect to author a business case that has formulas uh, that say basically 8%, in this case, it's configurable, that says 8% of the saved value from purchase order lead time reduction is attributed to data quality as long as the data quality score meets some threshold. In this case, it, the relevant CDEs have to be greater than 98%. Once this business case is approved, our platform, uh, it checks to see the data quality score of these CDEs to see if they meet that threshold that's configured in the formula. Then it, we query the data to find out, you know, where it's stored, and um, we're looking at the data to count the amount that we're saving for these purchase orders. And as long as the data quality score is greater than 98%, uh, we give uh, data quality credits um, for the role they play in this process. Let me <clears throat> jump into the tool now. So the data monetization tab, that's where we can also define uh, business use cases. We saw a technical use case earlier for that migration. Here's one I've already created around purchase order lead time reduction. So we organize these by industry and supply chain, or sorry, industry and division. In this case, it's supply chain. And the author of this business case, they provide this recognized value formula. So that's recognized value in the sense of how much value gets recognized for data governance if they meet certain criteria. So the recognized value would be the overall saved value from lead time reduction times 8%. And the recognized value criteria is the lead time validity. Validity is a measure of data quality. Uh, it has to be greater than 98%. So these values and quotes are actually CDEs, which have been linked to the business case over here. So uh, that's, that's what we see here, save value from lead time reduction. That is a CDE inside of this purchase order glossary. It also has a column map to it. Um, in approval history, so if somebody defines this formula, they submit it for approvals, and after it's approved, we connect to the systems, the data quality system, as well as the, in this case, it's an ERP system where the data is stored to actually calculate these values. So let's look at the CDEs. We mentioned the saved value from lead time reduction. That is a CDE defined in this glossary, and uh, we can see it's linked actually to a column, this total saved value. It's also, as we saw, it's a part of that business case. And this traceability will basically show us where is the data for the CDE located. I'm exploring from this business term, this traceability module. I can see there's the column. I can continue exploring this to figure out you know, precisely where that database is. So um, this column in this PO savings table in this ERP app schema, uh, and we can continue exploring to, to get even more details. So this gives us a map, basically, of this um, you know, business term to the column that contains the data. 
And I've illustrated that here. So as we explore that traceability, we identify the column, and if we query that column, we'll see total saved value has numbers like this organized by a date. Now in talking about the lead time, remember we had a criteria that says lead time validity must be greater than 100%. So lead time, the validity, validity comes from the third-party data quality tool. We can see that on the traceability tab. If I explore, I can see that lead time business term is validated by a business rule. And if I explore that business rule, I can trace it all the way down to, in this case, it's uh, Informatica IDQ, where the rule is implemented. The rule is implemented as a data quality rule, and that rule gets executed on a periodic basis. Uh, it's actually monthly, and we can see the um, different metric objects. So there's two metrics, one for the month of August, one for the month of September. And if we open these, we will see um, some statistics about that um, data quality rule from that date. I've opened that metric. I can see on this date in September, there were 32 valid records zero invalid, so 100% validity. In the most recent data quality metrics, validity score is what shows on the uh, business term. So that's where the 100% is coming from. So, you know, we've defined the business case, we've submitted it for approvals, we've, we've translated the CDEs into actual values, a data quality score for the lead time, and then an actual value from the database for the saved value. So, um, that's where these values come from. As long as this criteria is true, whenever this process executes, it's a monthly process, we can see the dates here. As long as this criteria is true, the validity greater than 98%, um, the recognized value of 8% is calculated. And 8% was configured here as part of the recognized value formula. So total value is 47,000, 8% of that is 3760 because the validity is greater than 98%. These numbers continue to come in monthly, and they roll up to provide an overall recognized value of, of data quality at the business case level. So this is just a sum of all the values from the months. Continuing on, I want to get into data marketplace. Our, our platform also provides a data marketplace to let users register sets of data, uh, what elements are within those data sets, and um, uh, then other users can request access to them in the marketplace. So our platform allows you to define, um, you know, dashboards or to, to measure certain things. So here's a sample dashboard that we've created showing, you know, which division in the company has the most uh, popular, or sorry, which division in the company is requesting the most data, which division um, owns the most data being requested, and then the popularity of the various data sets. So if I jump into the next tab, I'll see here, this is the organization. Uh, module of our application. This is where we can define the structure of our company, and within different divisions, we can uh, assign data sets that the division owns. So I have a data and analytics, a finance division, marketing, sales. I've opened up the sales division here. We can see uh, it has a data portfolio. It has certain applications it owns. It uh, has databases it owns, as well as certain business glossaries. The data marketplace tab is where we can register actual data sets. So this uh, customer data data set is one that I've registered previously for this sales division. If I open that data set, we can see it contains a price. So that is the price this data set will appear as in the data marketplace. The price could be zero, but if you provide a non-zero price, what will happen is when somebody requests it and is approved to access that data set, we record what we call a cross charge. It's just a record of the work that the provider is having to do on behalf of the requester whenever uh, the requester's um, request is, is approved in the marketplace. So price of $25,000, the frequency, this is a one-time uh, data set. It's just a snapshot, basically, of customer data. There are other values for frequency as well. It could be recurring on a periodic basis. It could even be um, something like a real-time, you know, like an API. The system of records, so that's an application, Customer 360. The provisioning system is the same application. Uh, we have various data elements. We have the 
in this case, customer's email, first name, last name, and whether or not that customer has opted in for email marketing. And those are mapped to actual columns which contain the data. Uh, as well as policies, we can define policies around data sets. Uh, in this case, there's a policy that says marketing emails can only be sent to customers who have not opted out of email marketing. Any previous requests that were made for this data set appear in this section here. We can see uh, somebody has previously requested this. It was actually the marketing division, and uh, they wanted to do a marketing campaign uh, via email. Approval history as well. This data set was previously approved, so this is just a recording of that approval history. That was the sales customer data set. Now we have uh, the marketing division. They also own some applications, one called Campaign Manager, a database as well. On the Data Marketplace tab, we can see they've started this campaign data set. That campaign data set, it has um, various uh, statistics around marketing campaigns, like um, you know how many emails did we send, of those, how many were opened, how many clicks were there in those emails, and so on. So this data set, uh, let's see, it has a status of pending to submit it for approvals. So I'll click this button, I can provide comments. And uh, now the there's an admin group who receives emails to, to notify of this new data set. Uh, they can click the links in those emails to come to this page where they can approve. Let me refresh the page and we should see the approval history. So I am set up as an approver. Um, I'm going to just approve that data set. And once I approve this data set, it will become visible in the Data Marketplace tab. So this is the Data Marketplace tab. Let me uh, refresh. We should see two data sets. There's the customer data owned by sales. Here's a campaign data set owned by marketing. We also have the option for users, you know, of course they can filter, search by name and other attributes. But uh, sometimes a, somebody might need data, but they cannot find it. Therefore, they can submit this request over here. We call this an ad hoc data set. So they sele uh, the requester selects their division, describes why they are requesting this data set, its purpose, priority, and they can select individual tables or columns here. So um, this is really just for the case of a user cannot find a uh, data set that they need. So that's what this would be used for. In this case, though, I'm going to select uh, an existing data set. I'll select the customer data set. We can see a few other details. I'm going to choose to request to it. The requester now uh, must provide their division. So I'll say marketing purpose. I'll say um, an October email campaign, priority medium. Before I can submit this request, I have to opt in that I will, uh, or I have to agree to follow any policy. So we can see that one defined on the data set around marketing emails. I must agree to follow these policies. I will do that and save. That submits the request. Uh, users are notified via email. The approvers are notified via email. Uh, they can come here and approve or reject. If they reject, uh, the request is closed and, and the requester would have to submit a new request. In this case, I'll approve. But we can see the first step of approval is the administrator approval. I will approve as uh, the admin. Now we go to the data set owner. So, so the person who registered that data set in the marketplace, we require them to approve as well. So uh, I'm set up as the owner. I will approve as that owner. And we should see the status change now. It's become fully approved. That means you know we're, we're complete with the approval process. The data can be shared. And uh, we've gone ahead and recorded a cross charge, just a, a record of the work that the uh, provider has to do on behalf of the requester. And that cross charge, in this case, it's um, $25,000. That amount is the uh, price which was specified on the customer data set, which we can see here. And again, that could be zero. It's not required to specify a price. So all of these requests, they're now affecting what shows up in this dashboard. We can refresh and see, um, we should see some updates. Um, click the refresh button. We can see the overall value of all the data being requested. It's $50,000. There have been two total requests for this particular data set. And um, it looks like marketing is the top requester and, and sales is showing up as the owner of the data being requested. So with that, um, I'm going to turn it back over uh, for questions. Thank you, everyone. 
Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Greg. And thank you, Sunil, for you guys for this great presentation. Um, I am going to dive here into here to answer questions and just the most to answer the most commonly asked questions. Just a reminder, I will send a follow up email to all registrants by end of day Thursday for this with links to the slides and links to the recording of the session as well as anything else requested. So diving in here. Um, so guys, why wouldn't you just take advantage of Amazon's AWS data exchange? So sorry, uh, I was. Uh, well, go ahead, Sunil. Can you hear me, Shannon? Yeah. Yeah, you sound good. We got yeah, you. Yeah. So the correct the Amazon Data Exchange does not offer the full fledged workflow capability and the governance capability that you would get with this platform. And I'm assuming it doesn't matter where those assets reside, regard for example, on prem, cloud, et cetera, et cetera. That is correct. I don't know if you want to add anything, Alex, but it really it um the the add data assets, the, the data sets and the data marketplace are conceptualized, they're virtualized. It doesn't really matter if they're on prem or in the cloud. Okay. All right, easy. Um, I love it. So certain three, does your software require a complete metadata catalog, including uh, for the files in a data lake? I'll let Alex answer that. So, so that is, uh, a lot of the things we showed are, are optional for that marketplace to work. You know, you could just create the data sets in our platform. Uh, it's not required to use all three of the various, uh, you know, I showed data portfolio management, um, the various business cases like the data quality example, and then the data marketplace. You could use one or, you know, all of these. You, there's no requirement that you use uh, all three together. So data portfolio is really um I mentioned there's two ways that can work that can connect directly to your data sources and, and scan them to, to identify those cost savings, uh, or it could connect to existing catalogs you might have, existing data catalogs that might already have some of that metadata. But we also offer um, a lightweight data catalog ourselves, right? But if you already got an existing data governance tool, metadata management tool, or data catalog, we'll coexist with that platform. And this is Greg, and what we've seen with a lot of customers is they utilize us almost as a catalog of catalogs because of the, some organizations have Calibra, they also have Alation, and they might even have Informatica's enterprise data catalog too. So utilizing what they've already done in those enterprise data catalogs and then utilizing the monetization and all aspects of those integrations between those. And one question also I, I noticed early on that I wanted to, you know, when I, when I said the business, the CDO's job, I think it's Pam, I, I do want to answer this, this is important. The CDO's job is not to, to own the data, it's to give the business the ability to take ownership of the data. I think that's important, and I think that's what your Data Connect does, That at least that's what we've seen early on with our customers. So, uh how do you calculate the 8%? This came up during your demo, Alex. Uh, is it, yes, it's configurable, but how do you come up with 8%? Why not 25% or 1%? Uh, great question. So so that's um, typically, uh, I, I didn't really show it, but for these business cases, um, there's a, typically a lot of involvement with finance to, to quantify what percentage, you know, is credited to data quality. So um, that's, you know, changeable. You would submit that as part of the approval process and then finance or whoever you set up as approvers, we see finance involved in these types of workflows a lot. They would, um, you know, they might iterate on the percentage and go back and forth before finally approving the business case. Yeah. Perfect. And what if you don't have a data quality tool? I'll answer, answer that question. question. I'll answer that question. If you don't have a data quality tool, right, then um, our, our platform does offer a lightweight data quality. I don't think, you know, we're going to say that we, uh, you know, we're a replacement for an IDQ or IBM yeah. information analyzer, but it does offer lightweight data quality. But if you do have a data quality tool like uh, Informatica data quality or IBM information analyzer or others will coexist with those. And we can show that, you know, how that works uh, I, that, from that question. So we, uh, we can show how that works through our presentation layer in, the, in, a, in a demo is what I'm saying. Sure. 
Um, yeah, and if you guys have a link to, you know, sign up for a demo, definitely let me know, and I'll get that out in a follow-up email as well. Uh, so knowing that nothing works straight out of the box, on average, how much initial configuration time is needed to see results from the tool? So we've seen, this is Greg, so we've seen anywhere from two to four months of being completely operational and in production. Um, and what if the data source is used by multiple divisions? Are you able to tag it with multiple divisions? That is uh, that is possible. So this uh, meta model, this tool is is highly configurable. So um, it uh, in in a lot of cases there is a requirement to to have that owner. Um, but if if you have multiple owners and you want basically all of those are, uh, sorry all of those owners to approve like a sharing of the data, that can be configured. Absolutely. There's also uh, a hierarchy you can set up. So one possible solution is um, that uh, division that I showed earlier, it could be organized in, as part of a hierarchy and you could have just a parent um, division which owns you know, multiple subdivisions and the ownership could be assigned at that parent level. So does the price of a data source change with time or when uh, add value is added to the data set? That's the, well, that might be again, run, the price of a, uh, a data source vary over time? Correct. So I think what you're really saying is the value, right? So the value, because uh, there's, there's two ways you can think about um, a data set in a marketplace, right? There's the, there's the, value for it, right? There's the value of a, uh, a data set and then the price you might charge for it internally or externally. There's two aspects to that. So the price is, of course, totally configurable, right? The value uh, may or may not uh, grow over time. It may decay. So generally, if the quality of your data set is decaying over time and you're not curating it through data quality efforts, then you'd expect that the value of your member or your customer data would decay over time. But if you're, but uh, obviously, if you're doing things to curate your data, then it might improve. Perfect. Um, uh, is there any way out of the box uh, or uh, to sync the data sets with the tool? I'm sorry. Uh, what was what was the question about data sets? I missed part of it. it, it, it you have an out of the box way to sync the data sets with the tool? Oh, absolutely. So so um, you could leverage this platform as the data marketplace in that workflow engine, but synchronize the data sets from somewhere external. Definitely. So you could say, Alex, that your your customer data is sitting in Oracle, for example. Right? Absolutely. Correct. And then you would basically uh, scan your Oracle database, right? Uh, database, schema, columns, tables and bring that all, you know, all that into your data connect, right? That's the That's idea. Right. Correct. So going back here a little bit to about the question um, regarding the price of a data source changing over time, so our data value, um, what can government agencies do to monetize data since they cannot make a profit per se? Correct. So that's a good question. So the question is how can government agencies okay. do to monetize data? So many government agencies now, uh, you know, obviously have the concept of open data, right? With open data, uh, many government agencies have a mandate to actually provide as many data sets as possible for use by the by the general populace, and that is oftentimes the remit of the chief data officer. So, in the case of um, you know a government agency, that's a good point. Uh, I, I have to give it some thought. In ter you know, in in the commercial space, you think about data monetization in terms of growing revenues, reducing cost, managing risk. In a government agency, um, you would have to think about um, ascribing a value to higher availability of data, but also potentially reducing risk, right? There's a risk reduction aspect to, uh, to data that would still exist uh, in a government agency. So, for example, I don't know if Alex showed, showed this to you, but we have a specific data monetization use case around integrating with ServiceNow. So, you have your list of applications in ServiceNow, and your data connect with scan service now, highlight all the applications that have not been certified in the previous 12 months, and, and send those uh, applications to the application owner for recertification. So presumably, when you recertify an application, you reduce the probability of a data breach, which means you, you capture some monetary value in terms of risk reduction. 
that specific use case around risk reduction would actually apply in a government agency as well. Shannon? I love it. Anything, yeah, anything else you guys want to add? All right, so kind of uh, continuing on that, um, uh, you know, the additional comment was government agencies value their data in terms of public benefits. Was that a question? It, it was. It was kind of an add-on to that, uh, but I think you had to talk to that. I didn't know if you want to add any additional. I think what comment. I said is what I said earlier, right? The whole open data and figuring out a way to ascribe a value to the fact that more citizens are able to access the data, that would be one way of thinking about the problem. Sure. So do you work with smaller companies that don't use Informatica or IBM tools? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, this, this platform could be used, uh, you know, standalone, or it could be used in conjunction with the Colibra, IBM, Informatica, et cetera. And does the tool harmonize data across platforms for the same data? What, when, when you say harmonize data across platforms, I'm not sure I understand what platforms are we talking about. Uh, I will have the questioner uh, elaborate a little bit on that. Uh, Dan, if you have additional comments on that, that's all there is in the question. Uh, I know there were some also some questions in the chat too, Ma. As well. Yeah, so just digging through there as well. Um, I do try and keep it in the q and A. If you guys have additional questions to submit in the q and A. Um, I know you talked about the CDO question already. Uh, kind of scrolling through. So. And then well, I, I think Tim King had a question too. You know, nobody owns the data in the organization, just like no one owns the cash. What we're saying is giving the business the ability to take ownership of the data, to actually use it for monetizational purposes. Because what a lot of companies see is when they build these monolithic data governance infrastructures across the organization, the business just doesn't use it. There's no reason for them to take ownership of that data, to use it for anything, whether that be analytics. But we're saying on top of that, taking the analytical documentation and monetizing the data on top of it. Perfect. So, we do have an. Uh, oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead. That's fine. Yeah. So we do have an expansion on the on the question. So the question again was: Does tool harmonize? Does the tool harmonize data across platforms for the same data? So, um, can this be used with applications such as, such as Tableau, multiple versions of SAP ERP? I don't think our tool is a – Alex, you can jump in. Our tool is not an ETL tool, right? So we're not trying to harmonize data across platforms. We're really focused on quantifying the financial benefits to really support the chief data officer as he or she is trying to, you know, explain the financial benefits of data management to the enterprise, right? Uh, correct, yeah. Yeah, and along those lines, Sunil, you know, it's, you know, there's the question here, is this a metadata tool or data tool? You know, the catalogs are purely metadata. Good question. So, so some of the business cases, like the one we saw around purchase orders, uh, part of the success criteria of that business case is actually connecting to the e, to connecting to the system that has the data and summarizing it, and then trying to figure out, um, you know, what is the quality that we have on file for that data, and and if that quality meets certain conditions, we give credit to uh, the data governance team in, in that scenario. Okay. So this is touching the data, not just the metadata. Right? Correct. Yeah. It's, I mean, different, you know, the data portfolio, that's really just touching metadata, operational metadata and all that. But when we get into business cases that, and we want to quantify, like, the value of data governance or data quality, that's typically looking at data. It's executing those formulas, uh, getting those values, you know, uh, they're typically, you know, dollar amounts, as we saw in that purchase order example, and um, giving credit. So there is definitely some... Uh, Involvement with data. Yeah. We love all the questions coming in. If you have additional questions, feel free to again just put them in the Q and A. Uh, is there a way to tie the past business outcomes and future target business outcome to the data monetization process? 
past business outcomes and future business outcomes to the data monetization process? The answer is yes. The way you would do that is you would take a specific business case, uh, uh, and the business case is configurable, right? As Alex showed you, you would have a business case around, for example, improving materials data quality so you can get purchase orders faster. If you get purchase orders faster, you get paid faster, which means you reduce networking capital. That's the broad brush. That business case is informed by your past experience because you, in the past, you know what your historical materials data quality has been. You have a pretty good idea about your working capital velocity, right? So absolutely, your business cases should be based on what has happened in the past and what you expect to happen in the future. So, do you want to add something? Shannon, did we answer the question about Tableau? Did we get to that one? We did. Okay, good. That's just okay. <laughs> Sorry. There's sure. a lot. A lot of questions. Okay, go ahead. Um, is this, uh, how much of this is dependent on how clean and structured your underlying data is? It's actually the worse the data is, uh, the better it is from a data monetization perspective. Think about it, right? Because the, the worse your data quality is, for example, for materials, it, it probably implies there's more room to improve data quality, which means there's more room to get your purchase orders faster and, get, and reduce your working capital. So, so whether your data is good or bad, you can still apply this platform, though honestly, if the data is bad, there's higher opportunities for, monet uh, for monetization. And how do you benchmark? How do you how do you benchmark um, your what part of data monetization in general? So we've done a lot of projects. <laughs> Yeah, we've done a number of projects on, on the services side of the house in different industries with different use cases. So we have a, we have a lot of uh, knowledge in house around, you know, what it looks like, like what is the value of customer data by industry? What's the value of genomic data you know, in healthcare? We've done a lot of work across different industries and different use cases. And when developing a business case, what are some of the early wins that create positive headwind for these projects? So, um, so uh, positives around uh, these these projects, uh, I I think one is around building a building a data marketplace to be able to, you know, share data. So if you think of you know a typical data sharing agreement might take anywhere up to twelve weeks, right? But if you're using the data marketplace, you can actually reduce the 12 weeks down to anywhere from four to six weeks. So now what you've done is there's a cost reduction. And we, we did the analysis for one specific data marketplace use case. And you're reducing costs associated with contractors and data scientists spending time getting approvals for data. And we put a number of $3 million based on, you know, 500 data requests a year, right? And that's just based on cost reduction. We didn't even talk about you know, revenue enhancements because data scientists have access to data faster. We didn't talk about risk reduction associated with doing something incorrectly. So uh, so that's certainly one tangible example. And does it connect to Atacama or Manta? Not today. But if it's got a REST API, we can absolutely, you know, sit on top of it. So we like from a data quality or perspective, like Autocom or MDM tools, we've connected to Informatica, so those solutions, right? So um, as, well, as Sunil said, as long as they have the REST API. I love it. And we'll just give everyone a quick minute to submit any additional questions in the Q&A section there. And again, just to answer the most commonly asked questions, just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email on the recording and the slides for this by end of day Thursday. Uh, mm -hmm. While we're waiting for well, any final question questions, come in. Yep. What, sorry, one question Gary Rector had about Doug Laney weighing in on near data connecting. I reached out to Doug and we'll, we'll coordinate a time when we get together. So no, that hasn't been done yet, but it's, it's going to happen, Gary. I love it. All right, well, that is all the time and questions that we have for today. Guys, thank you so much for this great presentation and really informative. It's uh, got a lot of interest going on here. Again, just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Thursday for this webinar with links to the slides and links to the recording of this session, uh, as well as anything else requested throughout.
So thank you. Thank you all, and hope you all have a great day. Stay safe out there. Okay. Thanks, guys.